Good morning and thank you for tuning in to our Summer Scholars webinar. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting this morning. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. My name is Tom Rogers and I'm a historian in the military history section here at the Australian War Memorial. Since 1985, the history section of the memorial has hosted 105 young historians under the Summer Scholars Scheme, providing them with practical experience of working in a major historical institution. Each scholar is paired up with an academic supervisor from the history section. But I would like to begin by thanking all staff of the War Memorial for your warm welcome of our Summer Scholars this year uh, and for your generous help with, with their work and their research. The key difference between our Summer Scholars program and other similar programs in Canberra is that when our scholars arrive, we give them their project. They don't bring a project with them and they don't choose their own project. That means that what you'll be hearing about this morning is the outcome of six weeks of intensive archival research. I think you'll agree with me that the results are very impressive. This morning, each scholar will present for 20 minutes. There will then be 10 minutes after each talk for questions. I encourage you to write in your questions for our scholars and write them in as you think of them because there is a short delay between you posting the text and us receiving it. Our first scholar this morning is Scott McCarthy, whose project was supervised by Dr Malia Hampton and Jenny Norbury. I will hand over to Scott. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for that introduction, Tom. Okay. When the first British tanks crawled into action on the 15th of September 1916, those of the AIF posted along the Somme bore witness to a sight truly unique, even by the standards set by conditions on the Western Front. One of the first Australians to sight the Allies' new machinery was Alfred Tiny Ryan, an Indigenous soldier of the first machine gun company. Writing home to New South Wales, he said, We were in the trenches beyond Fleur, where the tanks first went into action. The remains of three of them are still on the rise beyond Fleur, and the men who were in them were in them to the last and died at their posts. I guess they caused a bit of a stir when they first went over. That the tanks caused a stir upon release was perhaps an understatement. To the many Australian soldiers who, since arriving in France in the spring of 1916, had grown progressively wearied by the efficacy of what was by then a largely mechanised war, the tank appeared as the conjunction of modern industrial combat and Gothic horror. These perceptions are given a voice by men such as Private Reynold Potter, whose first encounter with armoured weaponry found him appalled with what he referred to as uncouth demons drawing nearer and vomiting death at every inch. Certainly many of the Australians' enemies agreed, with German prisoners describing the tank to be not warfare, but downright butchery and murder. There was a sense on both sides that the new machinery had rendered the war no longer a fair fight. These early perceptions provide an interesting point to contrast with the actualities of the tank's performance and capabilities. For in actual fact, the tanks employed throughout the Great War were riddled with design defects and plagued by operational shortcomings. Virtually all models prior to the Mark IV, released mid-1917, were effectively death traps. The eight-man crews squeezed into the Mark I's suffered terrible vision and directional sense and were subjected at all times to near deafening noise and searing heat, the internal temperature regularly reaching 50 degrees Celsius. The machines were fitted without suspension, meaning each encounter between the tank and a shell hole, of which France then boasted many, threw the operators around, often causing them to lurch and burn themselves on the engine and exhaust manifolds, which were situated inside into the front of the cab. The corollary of this design feature was the combustion and complete incineration of the crew in the event of a frontal hit by enemy weaponry, 
a possibility made all the more likely by the fact that the tank drove at a maximum speed of 6 km an hour and required a complete stop in order for it to turn. That a weapon so extraordinarily flawed could inspire fear or reverence in the hearts of observers is a testament to the dichotomy between its perception and its performance, a split which is very much a part of how Australians experience tanks across the First and Second World Wars. As far as the Australians were concerned, the perception of tank strength was initially challenged by the First Battle of Bullecourt in early April 1917. The action involved the 4th Australian Infantry Division advancing on the Hindenburg Line supported by tanks and tanks alone. So much faith was placed in the capacities of armour that the operation relied on the Allies' new weapon to essentially replace artillery support, which in retrospect was an absurdly ambitious task to present to a military corps in its infancy, let alone one armed only with primitive Mark I and II models. The action was disastrous from the outset, with many tanks failing to reach the starting line, while those that did were rendered impotent by obstructive shell holes and staunch enemy defence. Shown here where the red X's illustrate how far each machine got before suffering some disaster or another. This left the Australian infantry effectively naked to enfilading fire from German positions, eliciting a casualty rate of 75% for the 4th Division and a mass retreat. The operation was considered amongst Australian command to have been an abysmal failure, with Lieutenant General Sir John Monash declaring it to have made tanks anathema to the Australian troops. And this may have been true to an extent, but the fact remained that for certain survivors of Bullecourt, the assault had failed to extinguish the novelty of mobilised armour. Some soldiers concluded that the tanks had merely been met with bad luck in spite of their gallantry. Others, such as Private Wilfred Galway, even recorded amazement at the supposed fortitude of the tanks involved, the steel plating of which was not even entirely bulletproof. He wrote home, these tanks are wonderful things to watch in action. Wherever they go, shells follow them, but make not the least impression on them. A comment which is truly bizarre given the horrific tank casualties suffered on the day. That favourable perceptions of the tank could endure the experience of First Bullet Corps speaks to a stature that transcended mere material performance. What was clear in the aftermath of Bullet Corps and the broader Arras offensive to which it belonged was what tanks could not do, and this, it turned out, was a relatively long list. These limitations were catalogued and circulated amongst British command as early as April's end, 1917. Conclusions drawn from the tank's shortcomings advised the narrowing of tank objectives to more modest ends, the importance of tank infantry training, and the absolute necessity of artillery and counter-battery employment both for the purposes of facilitating the infantry's advance and for protecting tanks from anti-tank measures. Lessons learned here shaped the employment of tanks in successful actions throughout 1918, of which the operation fought at Hamel is a particularly transparent case study. Fought on the 4th of July 1918, the Battle of Hamel is remembered largely as the tank's day in the sun, due partly to the man who planned and executed the day's strategy, John Monash, who recorded for posterity that the day had been primarily a tank operation. And certainly it was the case that tanks contributed to the battle's success, which was achieved after a now famously brief window of 93 minutes. Monash's meticulous planning included preliminary reconnaissance, tank infantry training and the use of low-flying airplanes and artillery prior to zero hour in order to conceal the noise of the tank's approach, all of which had been urged by the mistakes of 1917. But the most important measure to take in to ensure the tank's success was to relegate their involvement to a subsidiary role behind air support and artillery, the latter of which was the true decisive factor, factor in Allied success dropping an exorbitant 132,000 rounds on enemy positions during the initial creeping barrage. While the Mark V tanks employed en masse at Hamel were a vast improvement on models employed at Bullecourt, they remained effectively vulnerable to anything resembling anti-tank resources. <laughs>
And not only this, but their interior conditions remained especially wretched, with a new engine cooling design ensuring that many operators were left incapacitated by carbon monoxide poisoning. The success of tank support here was the direct result of its limited role as part of a combined arms approach and not the product merely of technological advancements. This being the case, it is particularly interesting that tanks could essentially hijack the legacy of Hamel from that of an historic artillery operation to that of a great tank battle. This speaks to some extent to the influence of Monash's reflections, but in a broader sense, it speaks to the symbolic power of the tank, which ensured that the imagery of Mark V's remained at the forefront of wartime accounts of Hamel and the later offensives of the Hundred Days. That this symbolic stature drew in large part from the aesthetic appearance of the tank itself meant that the Australian experience of tanks was not exclusive to the AIF. From mid-1918 onwards, the tank became a large part of the Australian home front's engagement with modern warfare. The first opportunity to see a tank in the flesh was afforded the Australian people in late July 1918 when a Mark IV, now held in the War Memorials collection, arrived in the Port of Melbourne to be paraded in service of war loan fundraising. The tank was soon commandeered for the price of a thousand pounds and brought to Adelaide. Whilst obstacle courses were being used on the Western Front to facilitate tank infantry training, Adelaide's Unley Oval was repurposed to a perversely similar effect, allowing for the tank to demonstrate its physical prowess to captivated crowds during what was playfully termed Tank Week. The tank was christened Grit and returned to perform in Melbourne before continuing on to venues in the eastern states to similar receptions of excitement, shock and awe. Grit's arrival marked the beginning of a cultural adoption of the tank as a symbol of strength and military might, the nature of which was consolidated throughout the interwar period particularly as great war, art and literature permeated the Australian mainstream. Paintings and sketches such as Muirhead Bone's Tanks and Kenneth McQueen's Tanks Concealed in Thick Wood dramatised the shock value of the tank's physical appearance to an Australian audience. Popular First World War novels such as Eric Maria Remarque's All Quiet on the Western Front conjured images of the soulless tank consuming human life without feeling. Tanks that the Australians fought alongside here assumed the status of invulnerable steel beasts. This was the nature of tank imagery being internalised by the Australian public and this shaped public perceptions of the tank as an inherently menacing, threatening and therefore proficient weapon of war. And these perceptions developed symbiotically alongside an automotive culture that took hold of Australian industry in the late 20s and 30s, the corollary of this being a broader resonance of the imagery of tanks. For those who had never seen combat, it was far easier to picture oneself in the cab of a driven machine, romantically immune to enemy fire, than it was to picture oneself operating artillery or any other number of mechanical instruments of war. A valuable example of this is found in the case of Cambrai Day celebrations. The Battle of Cambrai was an Allied assault in November 1917, which retrospectively has been referred to as the First Great Tank Battle. Although no Australian infantry were involved in the operation, an annual remembrance began in Sydney in the late 20s. Whilst initial ceremonies honoured the Australian airmen who actually fought on the day, by the early 30s, this had shifted into a celebration of armour's involvement during the operation to crowds of gathered spectators eager to see tanks approach the Sydney Cenotaph. This cultural awareness of armour ensured that the proposed involvement of the Australian Armoured Corps in Second World War operations was met with fervent enthusiasm. There was a rush of enlistment for the country's first armoured division, many of whom had never seen a tank before and were struck with a feeling of wonder when first given the opportunity to begin their training. Trainees of the 2nd 6th Armoured Regiment, when presented with their M3 light Stuart tanks, initially insisted on a no boots policy when entering the cab, as it was, in their own words, a case of holy ground. <laughs> 
And this excitement was not curbed when, in 1943, it was confirmed that, in light of the Japanese threat, the Australian Armoured Corps' employment would be confined to the Southwest Pacific area. Preceding this blanket policy, the first opportunity for Australian armour presented itself in December 1942, when, in support of Brigadier Sir George Frederick Wooden's 18th Infantry Brigade, tanks of the 2nd 6th Armoured Regiment landed in the Hariko area of Papua to assist with the assault on Japanese positions at the Buna beachhead. What followed was a litany of short actions where the effective usage of tanks was greatly hindered by boggy jungle terrain and by effective, if somewhat impromptu, anti-tank measures employed by a resilient Japanese enemy, the 37mm anti-tank gun being an apparent favourite in their efforts to stop the Australians in their tracks. Measures such as these, including the use of mines, ditches and Molotov cocktails, proved particularly effective against the light-armoured M3 Stuarts. And this situation was compounded by the fact that Wooden's employment of the machines neglected to adequately apply those doctrinal methods which had yielded such success in times past. A case in point is the assault on the old Buna Strip undertaken on the 24th of December, six days after the inaugural action at Cape Endiadir. With the element of surprise then gone, Japanese defenders sighted two anti-aircraft guns at the top of the strip, each capable of firing three-inch high-velocity shells at the advancing tanks from protected positions. With inadequate reconnaissance undertaken prior to the attack, coupled with a lack of supporting arms, the 2nd 6th X Squadron lumbered steadily into Japanese crosshairs. Within less than two hours, all tanks involved in the action were destroyed, their operators relegated to stretcher bearers for the remainder of the day. While tank operations in Papua concluded with the successful capture of the San Ananda beachhead in mid-January 1943, their employment had been a terrific struggle. Mobility and travel had proven nightmarish in the jungle terrain, and this situation was made worse by the defensive tactics of the enemy. Tank crewmen had often been forced to operate with their vision slits shut due to enemy snipers, making it difficult to see and virtually impossible to communicate with the infantry during an advance. And even with their vision slits open, the terrain had rendered the enemy undetectable in the enveloping vegetation. Any further than five paces from the cab's front, twelve from the sides, while being totally invisible from the rear. The infantry had to remain within several feet of the advancing tanks at all times to defend against the Japanese swarming the machine and setting it alight, often by means of a suicidal attack. None of this was what had been pictured by the crewmen when they had signed up for the Armoured Corps. Far from invulnerable, the tanks of the 2nd 6th had been, from the outset, sitting ducks. Crewmen may at one point have considered their tanks wholly precious instruments, but their enemy had paid them no such respect. This was due in large part to the actual models involved. The Stuart's light armour had been fitted for desert warfare, where agility is valued at a premium, and not for the jungle, where mobility is rendered negligible by the terrain. But a major part of their failures was owed to their strategic employment, where, due somewhat to the unfamiliarity of jungle operations, the second sixth was regularly placed in situations where their limitations were exposed to the machinations of the enemy's defence that Wooden neglected the tank doctrine laid out during the Great War is clear to see in his post-operational report. While condemning the M3 Stuarts as ineffective for jungle warfare, Wooden went on to recommend for future operations such measures as a greater emphasis on artillery, tank infantry training, the use of low-flying aircraft to camouflage the tank's approach, and the necessity of pre-action reconnaissance all of which had been suggested as early as April 1917. So, much like the catastrophe of First Bullet Corps, the employment of armour in Papua was treated as a lesson to all future operations. And these operations were further assisted by the introduction of Matilda tanks, heavier models which proved far better suited to jungle combat than the Stuarts. The eventual equipping of flamethrowers to their hull in later frog models proved 
as you might imagine, especially effective against Japanese foxholes and pillboxes. But as Japanese anti-tank measures adapted to deal with the Matildas, it became clear that the predominant factor influencing successful tank operations was the adherence to strict measures of training, reconnaissance and artillery. Tank actions in Papua had demonstrated a misplaced confidence in the tank's capacity as a standalone weapon. Later operations demonstrated an awareness that the presence of armour could do little good without acknowledging and accommodating for its glaring limitations. These strategies culminated in the Operation Oboe II assault on the Balikpapan oil fields of southeast Borneo in July 1945. While the landing was the largest Australian tank attack of the war, the role of armour was very much relegated to a subsidiary role behind the Navy, the Artillery and the Air Force. A preliminary shelling, which lasted 40 uninterrupted minutes, flattened much of the Australians' objectives, including an extensive number of 127mm dual-purpose guns, which had been sighted in part to fend off the approaching tanks. Members of the 1st Armoured Regiment were left with rather sobering thoughts on what their fate might have been had the supporting arms not been so thorough. Much like at Hamel 27 years prior, the application of a combined arms approach here facilitated the tank's contribution to victory. That the action was such an overwhelming success with tanks relegated to this secondary role points once again to the fragility of their status as a dominant weapon in and of itself. So it was that Australia's experience of tank operations in the Second World War was of machines defined not by their brute force but by their vulnerabilities. Given these operations coming off a more than 20 year stretch where the tank had been raised as the key to victory on the modern battlefield, this experience was the dichotomy of perception and performance manifest. And as Australian tank operations continued into the latter half of the 20th century, it is, it's really quite interesting to note the state of public perceptions in the aftermath of what should have been a sobering experience in the Malay barrier. For it's a fact that the tank as symbol endured the woes of 1942 to 45, so much so that certain Royal Australian Armoured Corps veterans of the Vietnam War have found it necessary to protest the assumption that their job was easy and that their machines were impregnable to enemy fire. One might consider then that if men operating Centurion main battle tanks were a threat of succumbing to enemy fire, their machinery weighing a gargantuan 52 tons when fully armed, then the tanks of the First and Second World Wars were anything but invulnerable steel beasts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. That was um, a great presentation and I really enjoyed it. And as your supervisor, I'm really impressed with the, what you were able to do with the subject. Um, I would just remind our um, audience to send through their questions through the chat function on YouTube. Um, and in the meantime, <coughs> I just have a few questions um, to get us started. One is um, about the role of tanks in North Africa, because in the gap between the interwar period, I guess, and San Amanda and, and the Pacific, there is a use of tanks there, and I wondered if that, um, how that fits into your argument. Mm -hmm. Well, there were, as far as Australian armour was concerned, um, the extent of Australian tanks in North Africa was uh, resigned to cavalry regiments, um, but most of the discussion of tanks in that earlier period of the war is discussing the use of British tanks. And, and the successful use of those in early operations uh, in Libya, particularly the successful assault on the port of Bardia, um, which actually was a pretty useful, I, it's difficult to say propaganda, but it really was a means of maintaining that excitement in tanks prior to setting off for the Southwest Pacific because the, the commanding officer, whose name escapes me right now, uh, pr after the success was interviewed uh, national broadcast to Australia and uh, went on to discuss that basically the success of the operation was due entirely to the tanks involved and he, he makes some phrase uh, along the lines of tanks are worth their weight in gold and that if Australia is going to produce men to fight she is going to have to produce tanks to fight with them and so the extent of my research as it related to North African operations was really 
the, the contrast between those two because obviously in the southwest Pacific we have this early you know disappointment uh, whereas in North Africa you really have early success uh, and then and then results become more mixed from that point forward hmm. do you find um, there's a very big cultural difference between the tankies the men in the tank and the infantry you mentioned the um, Vietnam veteran who say who felt quite misunderstood um, and and a bit affronted that people thought that they were invulnerable. Do you find that happens throughout the, um, from the first and second world wars, perhaps, or in, from your research? Um, there's there's what I found was that uh, in the earlier operations in the Southwest Pacific, um, before they arrived, there was there was a sense that that was more or less the case. Um, that quickly evaporated, and there was a sense that um, the tanks are in trouble, and then it was more of um there was more of a relationship then between the infantry and the tankies. Um, once the Matildas arrived, um, my impression was that that impression shifted back to an idea of the tankies having a much easier job of things. Um, but there was a line in one of the one of these uh, Royal Australian Armoured Corps memoirs uh, where he talks about the fact that you know these things are are walking targets, and that once the enemy starts to fire, the infantry can hug the ground, but the the tanks they have to stay put. Um, and so, especially when it comes to a point when the tanks are 52 tons when armed, as an outsider, you can almost understand um, being almost jealous of the tank crewman's job, and that's where those impressions came up, but, but not so much in the majority of Southwest Pacific area operations. Hmm. That's great, thank you. Um, in the absence of um, other questions online. I'd just like to thank the people who've commented to say that it's been a great presentation because it has been and thank our audience for watching and participating and um, congratulations we've really enjoyed having you as a summer scholar. Thank you. Thank you very much Scott that was a fantastic presentation um, and uh, we're, we're very glad to have had you and to, to see the kind of research that you've um, done while you've been here with us. Our next speaker this morning is Bessie Mickelsons, whose project was supervised by myself and by Dr. Carl James. I'll now hand over to Bessie. Thank you, Bessie. Thank you for that introduction, Tom. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Bessie, as Tom just said, and today I will be talking about life in Fortress Darwin during the Second World War. Just before 10... Oh, sorry. I have to get... The PowerPoint is not working. Oh, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Just before 10am on Thursday, the 19th of February, 1942... The town of Darwin suffered a devastating bombing raid conducted by Japanese aircraft. The town of Darwin, as well as the shipping in the harbour, were laid to waste by 188 Japanese aircraft that had launched from four aircraft carriers in the Timor Sea. Mere hours later, a second attack occurred, this time carried out by 54 Japanese aircraft that had launched from airfields in Salivas and Ambon, targeting the RAAF aerodrome. With some 250 casualties and major damage done to Darwin, these first raids were the most destructive attacks on mainland Australia during the Second World War. For this reason, the 19th of February has become the focal point of remembering Darwin's experience of Japanese attacks, and it features prominently in Australian commemoration of the Second World War. These raids on the 19th, however, were only the beginning of a protracted campaign. Japanese attacks on Darwin, as well as other regions of Northern Australia, continued until November 1943. The 19th of February was merely the first chapter in a story of raids, anxiety and endurance that spanned almost two years. The Australian War Memorial holds hundreds of private records that detail the ongoing and drawn out experience of living through Japanese raids. And I should just take a moment to point out that because I will be referring to accounts that were written at the time, 
some of the expression and the language used to describe Japanese people that I will quote this morning are now considered racially offensive and should not be used today. Darwin's defences were not prepared for a Japanese air attack of the scale launched on the 19th of February. According to Warrant Officer Class 1, Keith Martin, of the 2nd 14th Field Regiment, we were sitting ducks and the Jap liked it that way. Those in Darwin took shelter as best they could as bombs began to fall. Radio operator PJ Chapman recorded in his diary that he was frightened as hell and he sat in a trench hearing the terrific rumbles and incessant explosions of the raid above him. Lieutenant Robert Brodrib hugged good old terra firma in no uncertain manner when he came under a dive gunning attack. In a convent in Darwin, Sister S.M. Eucaria and her fellow nuns prayed as we have never prayed before as they listened to debris from a nearby building landing on the roof. Both Sister Eucaria and Corporal Bill Teague felt that the, gun, the strafing from the machine guns on the planes was actually worse than the high-level bombing. Teague was a pay clerk with the RAAF and he wrote home, you hear the planes coming down at you and the crackle of their guns and the bullets spattering round the top of the trench. Then they have passed and are followed by others. During the first raid, Japanese aircraft attacked key administrative buildings. The Northern Territory Administrator's office was destroyed and his Indigenous maid, Daisy Martin, was killed when a concrete block from a damaged building at the Administrator's residence fell on top of her. The Post Office also suffered a direct hit, killed 10 people, including the Postmaster, Hertel Bald, his wife, Alice, and his daughter, Iris, who is pictured here. W.J. Henderson was the manager of Cable and Wireless Limited in Darwin, and he was also Iris's sweetheart. Immediately after the raid, he went to go and find her, but what he found instead was a scene of devastation and destruction. He stood in a state of shock as he watched the Bald family's bodies being carried out of the wreckage of the post office, one by one. He wrote later, I could have screamed. I thought I'd go mad. My little world had collapsed around my ears. As well as targeting the town, Japanese bombers carried out a concentrated attack on the shipping in the harbour. The American destroyer USS Peary was sunk, killing 88 of its crew members. Several other ships were also sunk, including Zealandia and British Motorist, while other ships, such as the Australian hospital ship Menunda, were damaged in the raids. Neptuna, loaded with ammunition and set on fire during the first raid, eventually exploded, which is what's causing the smoke you can see in this picture. The noise of the explosion was so loud and terrible that PJ Chapman recorded in his diary that he thought the end of the world had come. Delphin Cabillo, who was a traditional custodian of the Larrakia people in Darwin, was thrown onto his back by the force of Neptunus blast. He saw a pylon from the jetty thrown into the air as if it were a matchstick, and he was later to learn that his brother John was among the wharf workers who were killed when Neptuna exploded. Other indigenous people who survived Japanese raids later created artworks inspired by their experiences of living in or near Fortress Darwin. The second raid on the 19th targeted the RAAF aerodrome in Darwin, successfully destroying the two hangars and several other important buildings in what W.J. Henderson described as a marvellous piece of bombing. Corporal Teague was sheltering in a trench at the RAAF base during the second raid, and he lost several fillings just from the sheer force of the bombs that exploded around him. The damage was extensive, and the casualty count was the largest of any air raid carried out on Australia during the war. But the raids of the 19th of February were only the first two of a total of 64 raids that the Japanese carried out on Darwin and the surrounding area over the course of the next 21 months. Following the attacks on the 19th of February, Darwin's defences were strengthened. New air bases were established south of Darwin to disperse aircraft and equipment away from Darwin itself. As a result of a cabinet decision in December 1941, most women and children had already been evacuated from Darwin prior to the raids on the 19th. <laughs> 
After the raids on the 19th, all civilians, except those needed to carry out necessary works, either fled or were evacuated from Darwin. Among the evacuees was Sister Eukarya, who left Darwin only a matter of hours after the second raid. There was limited space in the army truck that was taking her south to Adelaide River, which meant that she and her fellow evacuees were forced to leave most of their belongings behind. Civilians moved out of Darwin, and over the following weeks and months, more servicemen moved in. Many of these were AIF soldiers, returning from the Middle East, and by March 1942, there were also 5,000 American personnel in Darwin. Therefore, many servicemen's experience of Darwin under attack began after the 19th of February, which is why it's so important to consider the whole period and not just the first two raids. Personal accounts of some of those who were in Darwin and neighbouring areas between February 1942 and November 1943 reveal a few recurring themes. Life in Darwin was punctuated by frequent raids, accompanied by ongoing uncertainty and tension. On top of this was a need to adjust to an unfamiliar and often very uncomfortable environment. And when there were no raids going on, the monotony of life in Darwin weighed heavily on many, creating a need to seek out ways to pass the time. After the 19th of February, Japanese air raids became a regular occurrence in Darwin. In June 1942, Chapman noted that everyone was on tenterhooks expecting more raids. Though many grew accustomed to air, to air raids, alerts and the frequent appearance of enemy reconnaissance planes, fear and anxiety remained features of life in Darwin. Sergeant Alan Brain of the RAAF's No. 3 Radio Installation and Maintenance Unit arrived in Darwin in December 1942. Such was his heightened level of anxiety that upon hearing a noise in the bush one day, he had a bullet loaded and ready to go in his gun before he realised that it was not an enemy soldier, it was just a wallaby. The constant anxiety was too much for some. In March 1943, one airman had to farewell a close friend who was being sent away from Darwin. He wrote that his friend was being sent south because his nerves had gone to pieces. Interestingly, the raids turned the thoughts of pilot officer Malcolm Taylor from No. 31 Squadron not to his own fear and discomfort, but to the plight of others. Even though Germany was Australia's enemy during the war, Taylor empathised with those subjected to ongoing Allied bombing raids, telling his mother, I just hate to think what is happening to the Germans these days. As well as being a source of ongoing tension, raids and air warnings were something of an inconvenience as they interrupted daily life. Police Sergeant Second Class Gordon Burt told his mother, Those damn Japs always seem to catch me at dinner time, just as I'm halfway through it. He grew increasingly annoyed that air raid alerts kept sounding just as he was about to eat his dessert. One day he warned everyone, Every time I'm getting my sweets there is an alarm, so get ready. And sure enough, the siren sounded as soon as he began to eat. Sergeant Burt was so desperate not to let Japanese air, ra air raids ruin his dessert that on one occasion he actually snuck back into the mess before the all clear was sounded just so that he could finish his pudding. While servicemen and others in Darwin were adjusting to a life regularly disrupted by air raids, those who were not from the Darwin area, which was most people, were also having to get used to a new and uncomfortable environment. Even though it was still part of Australia, Darwin was unfamiliar and felt foreign to many of those stationed there. Today is hot as hell, Sergeant Burt wrote to his sister. I'm writing this in my office and I am minus shirt and singlet and still feel hot. As you can see in these paintings by the official war artist Roy Hodgkinson, other men also chose to go without shirts in Darwin's heat. At times, some men even chose to forego clothing altogether. Such was the humidity in Darwin that Flying Officer Ralph James of No. 2 Squadron told his wife in a letter that his hair was wet with perspiration all day. He had to wash and oil his hair twice a day to prevent it from rotting. The extreme heat made for very difficult working conditions 
Gunner John Lawrence of the 2nd 1st Anti-Aircraft Regiment wrote that taking salt pills was necessary to make up for the salt lost through perspiration, as some men had fainted during a gun drill in the heat. In the wet season, which lasted from November through to April, rain and storms were frequent and intense. Pilot Officer Taylor wrote that when it rained in Darwin, everything just seemed to come down all at once. The good thing about storms was that enemy planes were actually less likely to carry out raids. Flying Officer James felt that poor weather was actually advantageous for Allied air crews. He wrote, It's harder flying in storms, but the nip can't follow you, and even if he tried, he couldn't see you. The weather also affected camp conditions for service personnel in the Darwin area. Lance Sergeant Frank Anderson of the 5th Battalion noted that a bed off the ground is a must, otherwise one is likely to be washed away. Camps could be quite rudimentary and uncomfortable, requiring men to put time and effort into improving their sleeping arrangements. Leading aircraftman David Howdle of the Number 55 Operational Base Unit recorded in his diary that he had to fill a bag with grass in order to have a mattress to sleep on. The local wildlife presented its challenges too. In Darwin's tropical climate, flies and mosquitoes flourished. In April 1942, driver Norman Tullow of the 124th Reserve Motor Transport Company wrote, Mozzie's a bloody nuisance tonight, driving us crazy. Larger creatures were also something of a problem. Flying Officer James wrote, this place is just lousy with snakes and scorpions and centipedes and even our swimming pool has a new tribe of crocs in it at present. Here, you can see a group of men cooling off in a river in Darwin, but they had to make sure that they had someone on watch, keeping an eye out for crocodiles. But crocodiles were not the only creatures that sometimes came too close for comfort. Sergeant Brain was writing a letter on his bunk one day when a death adder brushed against his foot. Needless to say, it gave him a very good scare and he promptly killed it with his bayonet. While those in Darwin were kept busy by work and kept on edge by frequent air raids, boredom was still a major part of life. Just a day was a common entry in leading aircraftman Howdle's diary, and others also noted in diaries or letters that things could be very quiet and very boring between raids. Flying Officer James told his wife that all the days seem so alike here, darling, that unless there's a church service, no one seems to know what day it is. Though certainly not relishing Japanese attacks, Corporal Teague wrote home to his family that at least raids relieved the deadly monotony of life in Darwin. Service personnel sought reprieve from this monotony in a variety of ways. Attending picture shows to watch films was a common activity that was mentioned in letters and diaries, as was playing sport, especially cricket and football, and attending several official sport carnival days that were held in the area during this time. Drinking was restricted by the limited beer rations, but it still gave men something to do and something to think about in their spare time. They eagerly anticipated the beer ration and lamented when there was no beer to be had. Throughout the diary of signalman Ronald Barber of the 2nd 14th Battalion, beer was a common motif. He wrote regular updates as to when the next beer ration was, how many bottles he was issued, how long it had been since he had any beer, and how the homebrew he had made was coming along. Other ways of passing the time included reading, gambling and playing two-up, fishing, hunting, swimming, and visiting friends in other camps. Men often also took the time to write, whether it was in a diary like this one, or writing letters home to their families. As well as giving men something to do, writing and receiving letters gave them a connection to their families, enabling them to maintain relationships despite the distance between them. This was clearly very important to many, with several men noting in their diaries the arrival or absence of mail, and men writing home thanking their families for their letters. Flying Officer James, who you can see here, felt as happy as I can possibly be away from you whenever he received mail from his wife Beryl. James told his wife on a few occasions that he actually did not mind the life in Darwin. It wasn't too bad, 
except that it meant being separated from her for so long. The remembrance of Darwin's experience of air raids has traditionally neglected two key points. The first is that the 19th of February, though certainly the biggest and the most destructive Japanese raid, was only the beginning and not the whole story in itself. The second is that there are elements of military service that have been overlooked, not only in Darwin, but in Australian military history more generally. During the period of Japanese attacks that lasted until the 12th of November 1943, air raids were a major part of life in Darwin, but these times of fear, tension and danger were interspersed by long periods of monotony, boredom and general discomfort. Those in Darwin made the best of their situation. They worked to make their living arrangements more comfortable and to find ways to help pass the time. These were major elements of being a service person in Darwin during this period, as much as was experiencing air raids. Matters such as the weather, or finding a snake in one's tent, or having dessert interrupted because of an air raid, might seem irrelevant to the overall narrative of Darwin under attack. But personal accounts demonstrate that seemingly minor matters like these were actually prominent aspects of life in Darwin between the 19th of February 1942 and the, 13th, uh, the 12th of November 1943. Personal documents allow us to better understand what it meant to experience and endure life in Fortress Darwin. And through this, these documents give us a deeper insight into this important period of Australian history. Thank you. Thank you, Bessie. That's a great paper as well, and I really enjoyed it. Um, Again, with the questions, we haven't had any come through online yet, but I would encourage our online audience to put them in if you do have any for Bessie. Um, one of the questions that I had was, um, with your conclusion talking about the sources that you used, um, you were able to draw all sorts of conclusions about civilians and other people alike. What were the sources that held by the Australian War Memorial that you used, and what were their limitations and benefits? Mm. Um, so the benefits were that through looking at personal documents like diaries and letters, I was able to get an insight into the minutiae of daily life in Darwin and what it was like to be there um, during raids and other things that I've talked about. Um, so that was really useful. Um, the limitations were probably, um, I was hoping to include a broader range uh, in terms of the demographic of people that I looked at and because it is the War Memorial, there was a very heavy focus on servicemen um, which is understandable. Um, so I was not able to find much from women, especially after the 19th, because lots of the women left, except for a few army nurses. Um, and also there were not any sources that I found from Indigenous people or members of the Asian population in Darwin. Um, so yeah, the limitations are that while it does give really good insight, there are parts of the story that the records that I've looked at don't allow access into. Bessie, thank you for that wonderful paper. Um, I had a question about sources as well. You've used um, personal recollection or personal diaries and letters from the time uh, to to tell this story. As you were working on it, were there any stories that were that you felt warranted further research, or where you wanted to learn more about them, or were there any stories that you weren't able to put into the paper, that sort of thing? Yeah, there was a lot of stuff that I was not able to put in because 20 minutes is not as long as I thought it was when I first came into this. Um, one story that particularly stood out to me was um, Flying Officer James, who I mentioned a few times and had the picture of he and his wife. Um, he really stood out to me because his collection of letters was very extensive. I think it was around 250 pages. Um, and so I feel like I kind of got to know him quite well. Um, and his story just struck me because I... It was very personal because he was writing letters to his wife um, and he spent a lot of time saying things like, I will always come home to you. No, there's no Japanese person alive who could stop me coming home to you. And I knew reading the letters that he actually ended up uh, being reported missing in action and then uh, was reported killed in action later on. So that was, um, yeah, quite poignant just to read those letters. And yeah, there's definitely more that could be told of his story, I imagine. And there were several other people who were in similar situations where their diaries or letters were very interesting and probably could have 
warranted a presentation all of their own. But yeah, I really liked looking at the personal element and yeah, especially the connection between the men and their families. Mm. Great, thank you. And we have had just a quick question from our Indigenous, Indigenous Liaison Officer, Michael Bell, um, who said it was a great topic and well presented. Um, and just wanted to know if you had a breakdown of the locations of the areas bombed in and around Darwin and in the north. Um, I don't have one with me. I have on, on my laptop a quite extensive timeline of when the different bombings were and where they were. Darwin was bombed the most times. Um, 64 out of a total of 97. Um, uh, the difficult thing with establishing a definitive list is that lots of the records differ. Um, the official records and things found in secondary sources. So it, um, the timeline that I've put together does have some uncertainties and discrepancies between when and where the bombings were. Um, but yeah, Darwin was the focus and there were a lot also on Wyndham and Broome and even some places in Northern Queensland. Yeah. Thank you. Again, thank you very much. And um, it's been wonderful watching what you and, and Scott, what you've both been able to produce in the time you've had. So I hope you're very proud of yourself and you. really well done. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Thank you very much, Bessie. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you, Scott, again as well. Two fantastic presentations that um, that show the depth of the archival um, collection at the War Memorial and what you've been able to do in, in just six weeks. Um, six weeks that have had various interruptions um, caused by all sorts of things, as has the rest of the world. Um, and so really well done uh, from all of us to both of you. Um, Thank you to everyone who's watching and thank you for tuning in to our, uh, our webinar for the Summer Scholars this year. It's the first year that we've done uh, purely a webinar approach uh, and it's one that is likely to go ahead into the future. If you yourself are studying history this year, have a look out and keep an eye out for the call for applications in August or September this year um, and maybe next year we'll be hearing from you. Thank you very much. Thank you.